Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Thank you, Ricky and Tiffany. It is love to be led and worshiped by you and all of our worship leaders. I, I want to share with you a line from one of my favorite poems, uh, a couple of stanzas from Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem, In Memoriam. Our little systems have their day. They have their day and cease to be. They are but broken lights of thee, and thou, O Lord, art more than they. I don't know if you like poetry or not, but there's a lot in those lines. He says our little systems have their day. What he means is our systems, our ways of seeing the world, our ways of understanding how the world works, our ways of understanding how God works, our systems of thought and belief and understanding. They have their day, meaning they're limited, they're temporary, they're not finite, they're not infinite. They have their day and cease to be. They come to an end and they, they are broken lights of thee, he says. That at best, my way of understanding the world and yours is a broken light, a partial truth about who God is and what this life means. And God, thou, O Lord, art more than they. And God is infinitely more than your way of understanding him. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Something in your life, you, you experience some relationship, some disappointment, some challenge, some pain, something that causes you to realize wait, my understanding of the world is incomplete. I, I don't understand enough about God. I don't grasp enough to put the pieces together for what I'm experiencing. And even though it's painful and difficult, we ought to be grateful for those things because God intends to open our minds and give us more, a clearer and better understanding. And really that, that idea of having our systems uh, broken and uh, rebuilt uh, our ways of understanding the world is at the heart of this series we're in called Following the King, having our understanding of who God is, who Jesus is, and what it means to follow him, what it means to be a faithful Christian. We're, we're having that reshaped by the teaching of God's word. And it's at the heart of this passage we're going to be looking at together today in Mark chapter 7. It's precisely what we're, we're going to see when these religious leaders called the scribes and the Pharisees have this encounter with Jesus. Both the religious leaders and Jesus' own disciples, his closest followers, are going to have their systems blown up, if you will, their ways of understanding what religion really is and all about. You know, some people that I interact with will say things to me when they find out that I'm a pastor, like, well, you know, I'm not very religious. I'm not all that religious. And often they say it in a way of saying, you know, like, why I don't go to church or, or why I don't believe when I try to engage them in a conversation about the things of God. Well, you know, I'm not that religious. You know, I, I immediately want to say back to them, Neither am I. With all sincerity, neither am I very religious. Uh, and I'm, I, uh, the fundamental issue is a misunderstanding about what religion even is. What are we talking about when we talk about religion? I, I don't believe Jesus is calling you or me or any of us to be more religious if we understand him properly. Uh, so spoiler alert, Jesus is not asking you to get more religious. Anyway, uh, for many people, religion is bound up in traditions customs, rituals, uh, and that have lost their connection to our everyday life. Maybe you've experienced that. You grew up in a church that had lots of traditions, but you really didn't understand what they had to do with anything that impacted your everyday life. That's really close to what we're talking about here in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to th through 23. I'm going to read the whole passage, and then we'll break it down together. Let's, let's look at Mark 7, 1 to 23. Now, when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of the cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your own tradition. 
For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, Whatever you would have gained from me is korban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of a man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Now, now that is a really, really powerful passage if we understand it. It's a little bit strange to us at first reading. It feels maybe like it's removed from us, and we need a little bit of context, historical and theological, biblical, to make sense of it. So when Jesus talks about the scribes and the Pharisees, let's, let me give you a little background for that. The scribes was a specific role in the Jewish uh, tradition dating back to the time of Ezra in the exile, uh, or right after the exile. Uh, the, the scribes, uh, they, were, they were initially those who translated or wrote down the law, recopied it. But over time, they became the, looked to as the experts of the law. And the Pharisees were an offshoot of this group about 200 years before the time of Christ. So in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, we get this verse about the scribes. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so the people understood the reading. That's a great definition of a Bible teacher. It's one I, I aspire to. They read from the book of the law, God's word, and they gave the sense of it so people could understand it. That's what they were intended to do. But here's what happened. Over time, leading up to the time of Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees didn't just read from the law and explain it. They added things to it. Traditions. Uh, you heard it referred to as the tradition of the elders. There was a whole oral tradition that surrounded the law of extra teaching and extra rules that were really just man-made traditions. These oral traditions got written down and codified in what we now call the Mishnah which is the second, the retelling of the law and the tradition surrounding it. So when you see the phrase in the text, the traditions of the elders, they're referring to the Mishnah, these oral traditions that the scribes and the Pharisees had developed over time. And they're asking, why don't your disciples follow those traditions? And Jesus doesn't really answer that. He goes right after them. We'll get to that in just a minute. These traditions were intended to deal with the problem of people breaking God's law. So the scribes and the Pharisees, they really wanted people to obey the law. And so they, they talked about something called building a fence around the Torah. You ever walk by a job site or a construction site, and they've got the big chain leak fence out there, it says, warning, keep out. Maybe there's, a, 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 there's an excavation going on, there's a pit, there's some broken metal and pieces that's dangerous. And they don't want you to go in there, so they put a fence far away from it to keep people far away from hurting themselves or damaging themselves. Similarly, the scribes and the Pharisees built a defense around the Torah, the Torah being the law of God, with their traditions. So rules and regulations that were traditions that kept people from even coming close to breaking the law of God. That's what they intended to do. But these terms that are used in this passage, sin, defilement, righteousness, these are not terms we use in our culture. These are not categories we even think in today. Uh, a, a book by a, a secular Jew who's not a believer, he's an, he's an atheist but grew up Jewish, named Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, is called The Righteous Mind. He also wrote The Coddling of the American Mind, two excellent books. But in The Righteous Mind, he says there's six categories by which we understand what's right and wrong in the world today, or w w which we could understand. Uh, harm, oppression, fairness, loyalty, authority, and sacred, sacredness or sanctity. And here's what he says. We think almost entirely in the first two categories, maybe three, harm, oppression, and fairness. That's all we think about. We have almost no way of talking about or thinking about the last two, authority and sanctity. But that's precisely what the scriptures talk about. So you, you see this all the time, right? We talk about if something is good or bad based on does it harm anyone. 
Does, is anybody being oppressed or exploited? Is it fair? Is it equitable? We never talk, at least in our secular culture, about is there a higher moral standard, an authority beyond us that would tell us this is right or wrong? And I, we've lost the capacity to do that, but that's what this text is driving at. Jesus is going to overturn their false religion and their empty traditions. But here's what he's not doing. He's not throwing out the categories of right and wrong, of good and evil, of clean or unclean. He's redefining them in a way that really matters. Our, our contemporary tradition, our, our contemporary approach to tradition is to say, oh, all that stuff about, about evil and, 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 and good and bad and, and righteous and unrighteous, that's all, that's all you know, in the past. That, that doesn't matter today. What matters is just be true to yourself. Just, just honor the, your inner self, your inner voice, and that's what matters. That's how you know what's right. That is not what Jesus is saying. He's saying there is an authority. There is a standard but he's gonna redefine the categories for these scribes and Pharisees and for us, if we're paying attention. Okay, so let's look first at what we're gonna call the trouble with tradition. The trouble with tradition. Jesus is not necessarily saying that all traditions are bad. You have traditions in your family. I have them. We're heading into the holiday season in a couple of months, or actually about a month. We'll be into the, what we call the holiday season, Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, and it's fun. And you've got your traditions for how you observe those things. Maybe you've got traditions in your town, certain ways. I remember my wife and I used to take our kids and drive to a little neighborhood in Aurora because the tradition on that street was to put up the Christmas story and lights and these big displays. And if you lived there, you had to follow that tradition. That's a good tradition. There's nothing wrong with that. So traditions aren't bad uh, in and of themselves. That's not what he's saying. But what happens, especially in your relationship with God, when tradition turns toxic, when you invert things, when you start taking man-made traditions and elevating them at least to the level of or above the teaching of God's word, above the relationship God desires, that's what he's after. Yaroslav Pelikan, the Croatian uh, theologian, puts it this way, tradition is the living faith of those now dead. That's a good thing. Traditionalism is the dead faith of those still living. That's not a good thing. Living faith is a good thing, but of, of those that are, are, are dead. We, we carry on the living faith, the living tradition of the gospel, those that have, have gone before us. But a dead faith, which is stuck in just this mindless tradition, which has no meaning and no bearing on our hearts, that's not a good thing. That's what Jesus is after here. So what is with all the washing stuff, right? In the first couple of verses, he talks about washing. Uh, here's what he's not saying. He's not saying the, the Pharisees and the scribes are not criticizing the disciples for having bad hygiene. Like we talked, remember, do you remember when the pandemic started? Like every day on every news channel was like instructions on how to wash your hands. Like we'd never washed our hands before, right? You remember you had to sing happy birthday? I remember one, one uh, doctor was saying you had to wash your hands while singing happy birthday. That was about how long you should do it. Make sure you get both sides, children. You know, they were telling us this sort of thing. They're not concerned about hygiene habits. They're concerned about rituals and traditions that, that symbolized ritual purity. How do you know you're clean before God or right before God? That's what they're concerned with. Uh, in verse 5, we're even told, Why don't your disciples walk according to the tradition of the elders? Why aren't they? They aren't saying, why don't they follow the word of God? They're saying the traditions which they elevate to the level of God's word. That's the problem. That, again, building the fence around the Torah. Uh, so, for example... Moms and dads, if you don't want your new carpet to get muddy when your kids come in from playing outside, you could say, well, here's the rule. Your shoes have to come off in the garage. So you're putting a rule. You, the, the concern is don't get the carpet muddy. But you back up from that. Oh, well, keep your shoes off in the garage. Or you might say, all right, our, all children must strip down in the garage while I hose you off, right? That might be even a wiser thing if it's been raining outside. But what happens if the hose becomes sacred, if the washing becomes sacred, if you can't know that you're acceptable to come into the house, to mom and dad's house, unless you've been washed? We're missing something, right? The, the tradition now has taken on meaning it was never intended to. And that's what began to happen in Jesus' day. We, we have this tendency to attach spiritual significance and divine authority to our preferences and our traditions. Years ago, when I was a new pastor here at our church, many, over 20 years ago, uh, a man in our church wrote a letter to Pastor Brian, who was then the senior pastor, complaining that I did not wear a tie when I preached last Sunday. Uh, and so 
uh, Brian laughed about that with me and mentioned it to me. And I had a, a, a conversation with this man a few weeks later. And he said to me, with wagging his finger, what's it going to take to get you to wear a tie, to honor the Lord by wearing a tie when you preach? Now, uh, maybe I should have brought a tie today. I didn't. But here's his point. That, that had become so important to him that he almost couldn't hear the message of God's word. It had become a tradition. Pastors wear ties when they preach. And it had been elevated. So let me put it this way. There are good traditions we have in church and in worship that can help us come into the presence of God, but we should always be careful not to elevate those things to the level of God's Word itself. And one of the best signs of a healthy church, of a really healthy church, is when the people of the church are most fired up and excited and passionate about the things that are most central to the gospel. Let me just ask you for a minute. What gets you fired up? What gets you really passionate? Politics? The economy? The bears? What, like, what do you get fired up about? As it relates to your faith, what fires you up? Peripheral theological things? Debates about the end times? Or is it Christ and his mission, what he's done for us at the cross, his love and forgiveness and mercy and grace? One of the best signs about us would be if we're most passionate about what most matters to God. Flip that around, one of the signs of an unhealthy church is when people are all really fired up about all the external peripheral things and not about the heart of the gospel. We should always be, I think, examining ourselves on that. So let's look now at the heart of a hypocrite, the heart of a hypocrite. Jesus calls them hypocrites, and then he quotes from Isaiah. He says, you, you, well, did Isaiah say of you hypocrites? We'll get to that text in just a minute. We think of a hypocrite, you probably do, and I, I, I tend to think of it this way in our culture, as somebody who's a fake, who's a phony, such a hypocrite, as if they're intentionally pretending to be something that they're not. That's one definition of a hypocrite in our culture. But if we're paying attention, that's not exactly the way Jesus uses the term and not how he defines it. Let's look at verses 6 through 8 of chapter 7. And he said to them, make a few notes on this one, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. There's the word. As it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave, the com this is a key phrase right here, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. That's the problem. That's what he's going after. So for Jesus, a hypocrite, on his terms, is someone who has external obedience, honor me with your lips, without internal transformation. Your heart is far from me. That's a hypocrite in Jesus' terms. You're saying and doing the right things, but there's nothing going on in here, no real love for God happening in your heart. I've, I've heard people say things to me like, you know, I, I don't want to be a hypocrite, Pastor Jeff. S meaning, I'm, I'm not coming to church because, you know, I'm not really living out my faith and I've got some issues and I don't want to be a hypocrite. I want to go there and pretend. You know, it's not hypocritical to go to church and worship God when you don't feel like it. That's actually a sign of maturity because you know that you need it. That's not a, what a hypocrite is. Hypocrisy is pursuing tradition over Jesus, is going through the motions without anything happening in your heart. Uh, in verse 8, he says this, this phrase, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. That is when tradition turns toxic, when you leave the commandment of God and pursue the traditions of men instead. Now, in the next few verses, which we're not going to put on the screen, Jesus gives us a kind of case study for what he's talking about. He goes into this part about the law of Moses, honor your father and mother, and korban. Do you remember this? Let me explain in brief. Uh, in Leviticus 27, there were regulations given to God's people about how they could make a vow, how they could make a, a dedication of property or belongings, uh, whether it be crops, land, livestock, or, or possessions to the Lord. And there were specific rules about that. But over time, the, a tradition had developed. It was kind of like a deferred giving program where Jewish people would declare a piece of property, uh, some, some possession as korban. The word literally means offering, but it meant it was, it was uh, sort of off limits, dedicated to the Lord. But it wouldn't be given to the Lord, to the temple or to the synagogue until after they died. So here's what happened. I could, if I had an estate, take part of my estate and say, this is now korban. I've dedicated to the Lord. When I die, it'll go to the temple and to the priests and to the service of the Lord. 
I can enjoy all the benefits of my own property while I live, and nobody can touch it or claim it, or, or you know, it's like being like tax-free today. Nobody can have anything to do with it because it's, it's dedicated to the Lord. I get the benefit of looking spiritual to all of you. Oh, look, he gave half his estate. It's Corban to the Lord, but yet still enjoy it. And Jesus says, but what happens is your mom and dad fall on hard times, and they need help. One of the ways you honor them, which you're commanded to do in Scripture, is to provide for them. And yet some of you are saying, oh, oh mom and dad, look, uh, 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 this seven-bedroom house I live in, in this estate, well, it, I know it looks like I have a lot, but it's actually all Corbin. I've dedicated to the Lord, and so I, I'm sorry, I can't really help you. I mean, it's dedicated to the Lord. How ridiculous, how tragic, how awful that they would deny the command of God because they've made some loophole in their own traditions. Now, that's a technical thing that was going on in the first century. But let's not be too quick to think that we don't do the same thing. We look for ways out from under the commandments of God. We value our traditions and our preferences above the law of God. And then Jesus says in verse 13, thus making void the word of God by your own tradition that you have handed down. How awful and tragic it would be if we make void the word of God because of our own traditions. How sad and tragic if our religion consists in nothing more than beautiful buildings, familiar phrases, historic traditions, songs we like to sing, the seat we like to sit in, the people we enjoy being around, and that's all we do. We feel good about ourselves and comfortable and mildly spiritual, but there's nothing going on in our hearts. No overflowing love for God, no passion for the gospel, no desire to serve. By the way, this problem cuts across conservative and liberal lines, theologically. There are conservative and liberal churches that get this wrong, that fall into the traditions, the trappings of just go, what, what our preferences. May it be true of us that we hold to the gospel of Jesus Christ, even if it means leaving some traditions. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Here's what I noticed. Some of us in our culture today, we're not, we're not down with all the traditions. It's kind of, it's cool today to say, you know, I, I'm moving on from the traditions of my parents in the past and previous generations. I'm kind of making my own way. But we're guilty of the same basic problem because of our own ideas, our own preferences, our own philosophies. So we may not be holding to old traditions, but we're, people say things like, well, I don't believe that God would say this. Or I don't, can't believe in a God who would. You know, and, and when if I talk to people like that, maybe it's some of you, uh, you've got an opinion like, I don't believe that there's a hell. I can't believe in a God who would do that. And what, what if I said, well, what if I can show you in Scripture where, where God teaches this, where we understand the teaching? It wouldn't matter, because I can't believe in a God like that. What's happening? I've just elevated my own opinion my own preference above the teaching of the Word of God. And we do this in all kinds of ways. It's the same basic issue going on here. These things that I prefer and that are comfortable to me and that make sense to me are now more important than what the Word of God says. That was happening in the first century, and don't kid yourself that it's not happening in the 21st century in your heart and in mine as well. Okay, the last section then is really the heart of what Jesus is driving at. I know we haven't even gotten to the most important part yet, but all of this is sort of a preamble and a buildup to the, the heart, and you're going to see that word a lot in the message here. This is the question of cleanness, the question of cleanness, not physical cleanliness, but cleanness meaning, if cleanness means being acceptable to God, the biblical term for that is righteousness, being in right standing, clean before God, the psalmist praise, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. How does a person get cleaned before God in right standing? That's the question that all of this discussion about tradition and religion is driving towards. It's the fundamental question of the human condition as well. We don't use these terms like defiled or unclean or righteous or unrighteous, but it's what's happening in our hearts. That's what Jesus is driving at. Let's look at verses 14 through 23. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. That's a shocking statement Jesus makes right there. He says, listen to me, understand this. 
Nothing from the outside can make you unclean. Only what's already in you is what defiles you, makes you unclean. This is category shattering to the Jewish mind. What are you talking about? In fact, it's the reason that the disciples come to Jesus next and they say, when he had left the, uh, and when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. Basically, the disciples <laughs> come to him in the house when they left the crowds and said, what are you talking about, Jesus? Haven't you read Leviticus? Don't you know that our whole religion is built on avoiding all the unclean stuff? I mean, isn't that what it means to be a faithful Jew? Jesus goes on. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding, his disciples now, do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of a man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Whoa. It's, it's hard for us to get our minds around how shocking this statement is of Jesus to the Jews of the day. The disciples don't get it. Their whole way of life is about avoiding unclean stuff, staying ritually purified and clean before God. They had whole systems of ritual purification to make them clean if they accidentally or unintentionally became unclean. We have an equally difficult time in our culture with these, this same teaching, but for different reasons. The state in which we find ourselves, this is a quote from Franz Kafka's, one of his journals. The state in which we find ourselves today is sinful, quite independent of guilt. I'm quoting here, uh, Timothy Keller in his book, The King's Cross, on this passage, quotes Kafka, and he's right. The state in which we find ourselves today is sinful, quite independent of guilt. We feel like we're not right, but we don't like the categories of guilt and, 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 uh, and sin. K Keller goes on, in other words... We live in a world now where we don't believe in judgment. We don't believe in sin. And yet, we still feel there is something wrong with us. I think that's profoundly true. I encounter people I, my own life. We don't use these categories. We don't like to talk about sin and judgment. But deep inside, we know we're unclean. You know that you ought to be better than you are. You don't have to think about that. And we have uh, uh, psychological uh, you know, uh, industries and movements trying to tell you different, that you're, that you're good as you are, that, you, that it's the power of positive thinking, to believe in yourself, get in touch with the inner self, and that's good and, and pure. But Jesus has something very different. And it's offensive in our culture. And I want you to hear it. He says, there's nothing outside of you that can make you unclean. You're already unclean in your heart. And when you, if you're going to pay, if you're going to be honest with yourself, all that stuff—sexual morality, def, gossip, slander, envy, wickedness, sensuality—that all comes from within, not from without. It's already in there. Is his point? What do you do about that? What do we do about that? We don't use terms like clean or defiled or righteous, but we know there's something wrong in here. We feel it. This brings up the question, the central question, how does a person get clean? If it's true that we're not made unclean from the outside, but we're already unclean, sinful on the inside, what's the solution to that? Clearly, it's not by moral effort. Clearly, it can't be by keeping the rules and the traditions and obeying, because that would be outside in cleaning. I can't do that. I'm not capable of that. To answer this question, Jesus first shows us what makes us unclean. So it's not what you eat, what you touch, what you do on the outside, right? I've got a friend, I've quoted this many times, he's a pastor, and he likes to say that too many Christians today approach living their life, uh, their, their Christian life, like going into a, a gas station bathroom. You go in, you touch as little as possible, you do what you have to do and get out as quick as possible. You just try not to get defiled, right? That's not how God's called us to live in this world. And this is not to say there isn't evil in the world. There aren't unclean and dangerous things. There are. But it's talking about our heart. What changes a person's heart? Is it just avoiding all the bad stuff? First of all, you can't. Second of all, even if you could, it wouldn't change what's already wrong inside of us. You cannot clean yourself by moral effort. 
by going to therapy, by you know, psychological practices, by meditation, by giving enough to pay off your, you know, the sins of your past. There's no moral effort that can clean you on the, in your heart. Jesus gets a little graphic in his explanation, doesn't he? He uses the phrase, what goes into a man goes into his stomach. That's the Greek word koilia. Uh, but it doesn't touch his cardia, his heart. Koilia is stomach, bowels, intestines, <laughs> and it's expelled, he says. You know what he means. He says, the stuff that we from the outside doesn't touch our heart, and heart cardia doesn't just mean your beating heart organ. It means your inner self. How can Jesus declare all foods clean? Did you catch that? Mark doesn't always make editorial comments, but in the passage he says, by saying this, he declared all foods clean. That's crazy to a Jew. There are foods you don't eat. The law says so. Jesus says, no, 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 I've declared all foods clean now. How can he do that? Well, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, we get a hint for how he, how he does that. Do not think, Jesus speaking here in the Sermon on the Mount, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass in the law until all is accomplished. Jesus says those laws which were meant to symbolize ritual cleanness before God, I have fulfilled. Jesus is saying, I am cleanness. You remember the story where Jesus touches the leper and then he says, be clean? Lepers were the symbol, symbol in the culture of what it meant to be unclean. They had, to, they had to call out unclean for crying out loud if they walked down the street so no, so no one would be defiled by being near them. Jesus touches the leper and the leper is made clean. The point is, whatever Jesus comes in contact with, he cleans. It's made clean because he is cleanness. He cannot be defiled. He's the source of cleanness. That's what he means when he says, I have fulfilled it, and it's accomplished at the cross. His blood purifies us from all sin, the New Testament tells us. He's the one that cleans us. So, let me put it simply. The way a person gets clean is either outside in or inside out. It's one or the other. And if we're thinking about it, outside in, this is religion. That's what this is. This is religion and traditions, and there's no life in it. Inside out is the gospel. There's all the difference in the world. When I said at the beginning, Jesus does not want you to be more religious. He's not looking for you to clean yourself from the outside in by following the rules. You can't. He has no interest in your religion. So some of you, I know what goes on in your mind. You're thinking, oh, I've screwed up. I've made a mess. I've such a, I, I, I've screwed up my life. I've I got to get to church and like, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, and that maybe God will be more pleased with me. Or I've got to do some more good in my life to balance the scales. And then somehow you're going to work off your guilt or your, that's, Jesus has no interest in that. No interest at all. That's dead religion. In Psalm 51, David says, a broken Heart, O oh God, you will not despise. A broken and contrite heart, he says, are what God desires. The only kind of heart that Jesus can heal and clean is a broken one. So all God wants from you is this. Recognition that you're broken, that you're unclean, and surrender to him, the broken heart. Then he can clean you. It's when we think we're fine or are trying to do it on our own that he can't do much with us. But when we come to him and say, I, I've been trying from the outside in my whole life, and I made a mess of it. I can't make myself clean. Jesus, you clean me. That's when he does his best work. Now, Jesus is not throwing out the categories. He very much wants you to think about what makes you unclean. But he wants you to understand it's not out there. It's in here. And some of us have been on the church for a long time. We slip into this thinking of those are the bad people, the ones to avoid. They are the problem. That's... That's outside-in thinking. What Jesus wants us to do is turn to our own hearts, examine our own hearts, and then lay them open before him. The Apostle Paul puts it beautifully in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Let me pause there. God, for those of us who have prayed like David, Lord, Lord, make me clean. Restore to me a clean heart. 
and have known his grace, which comes into your heart and forgives your sin. God then in your life, the way that you live, is making his appeal to the world through you and through me, to other people who desperately need to be made clean. He goes on, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And then this famous, famous line, which is so important. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made Jesus, who was sinless, to take on all our uncleanness and sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, clean, right before him. What that means, friends, if you're in Christ, God looks at you and doesn't see your past, doesn't see all the junk in your heart, doesn't see all the things you're ashamed of. He sees his son, his beautiful, perfect son, who covers you in his righteousness. That's what it means to be in Christ. To be a Christian simply means that. It doesn't mean we're better. It doesn't mean we're more perfect or we figured things out or we have more insight or we're wiser or we're, you know, we, we live a morally perfect life. Not at all. It means we understand that the only way anyone is ever made clean and right with God is by the renewal of the heart which comes through the grace of Jesus Christ. God cares nothing about our religion. He cares about your heart. Will you give him your heart? Will you surrender to him your heart? I know for some of you, you may have been coming to church online or in person for years and you've never done this. You've never laid open your heart and said, Jesus, take it. I can't do much with it. It's pretty dirty. You clean it up and he will remake it. He will remake it and forgive you and restore you and set you free in a way you can't possibly fathom. That's, what, that's the difference between an outside-in approach to religion and dead tradition and the living faith of the gospel, which cleans hearts and sets us free. Let's pray. God, thank you for the way that you love us. Thank you so much for your grace and this ancient, strange story about traditions and customs, which really, if we're paying attention, is so relevant for us, God. We, too, elevate our preferences, our traditions, our desires over the truth of your word. Forgive us for that. How tragic, God, if we would go through the motions of religion and never know the freedom and joy, that peace that comes from your gospel. Thank you that you look at us and you want to clean us from the inside out. You see all that's wrong with us and, and that is broken and needs to be dealt with. But you also see the love of your son, which can come in and set us free. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. If this message has been beneficial to you in any way, please consider liking and subscribing to however you're watching this message and even consider who you might want to share this with. Um, and I know today we talked about our hearts, about how God can make us clean on the inside. If that's something, if you feel like the Holy Spirit might be doing something in you and you'd like to discuss it with, one, with somebody on staff or with me, please text hello to the number shown on your screen. I would love to talk to you more about that. So right now, let's go this week and be a people that's not made clean by the outside in, but by Christ from the inside out. Bless you, church. Hope you have a great week.